Well, welcome everybody to um, our conversation today uh, with Eduardo Halfon and Claudio Lomnitz, uh, who it's a great pleasure to see here. I'm Mark Mazawa. Welcome everybody. Uh, a special welcome to Eduardo Halfon, uh, who was a fellow at the Institute uh, and a uh, 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 warm welcome uh, to Claudio Lomnitz, the Campbell Family Professor of Anthropology at Columbia, but who, uh, to judge from the decor behind him, is somewhere warmer, and as I think in Mexico at this point. Um, and thank you both very much, because I'm hoping that this will be the first in a series of conversations about <clears throat> a topic which I know uh, you both have thought a great deal about, uh, which is uh, uh, writing about lives, about our own lives, about our families' lives, about the lives of others in, in different dimensions. So let me just begin by briefly introducing our two speakers. Uh, I should say I'm Mark Mazauer, I'm the director of the Institute for Ideas and Imagination. Um, and uh, joining me today is Eduardo Halfon, a well-known writer, I think I can say, uh, from Guatemala, uh, who was with us for a year at the Institute, who, who's published a number of novels, uh, I think 10 or more at this point, and whose latest work, Cancion, is about to come out, or has just come out in French and Spanish. Um, he became known in the Anglophone world when uh, one of his novels was translated as The Polish Boxer in 2012, and two other novels of his have uh, been published since and have been garlanded with prizes. Mourning, I think, won no fewer than four literary prizes. He's, he's a wonderful writer. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us, Eduardo. Uh, and Claudio Lomnitz, a professor of anthropology at Columbia, uh, who has his PhD from Stanford from 1987 and who's an expert in Mexico. Uh, and who's written a number of important works on Mexico, starting with a, a study of the rural society and rural change in Mexico, and then moving uh, uh, through a study of the crisis, uh, a fantastic book on death and the idea of Mexico, and then a wonderful, um, huge tapestry of a biography of, of a Mexican anarchist, Ricardo Flores Magón. Uh, which was published by Zone Books in 2014 and published two years ago, Nuestra America, which gives our event its title, Our America, um, which is a, a kind of family history and which is about to be published uh, early in the coming year by other press under the same title. Um, and so I was thinking of you both uh, and the commonalities uh, in, uh, in, in your work that, that it explores um, in a variety of forms uh, certain questions about uh, the situation of, of America from the point of South America and, their, and therefore Spanish America, um, which you are interpreting to the North but at the same time, Spanish America as seen through the eyes of descendants of Jewish immigrants from Europe. And it's my impression um, that, that, that your own personal vantage point on what you do has become more and more salient in your work over the years. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to I, throw out perhaps a couple of themes um, to get the discussion going uh, uh, that occurred to me as I was, as I was uh, reading your work. Um, one is that in your, in your recent work, both of you have um, made family the subject uh, of, of your writing, your parents, your grandparents. Grandparents play a very, very important role. Um, and what is distinctive I think, is, is that um, not, uh, obviously they are a link with Europe, they are a link with another world, they are a way of thinking about the Americas, but you're, you're doing something else as well, which I think is of wider significance. You're trying to imagine your grandparents as children mm -hmm. as well. 
So they are simultaneously your grandparents and they are the children. And there's something interesting about putting yourself in that position that I, um, I, I'm curious about. Um, the second is obviously the question of language. And uh, th that's to say the language that you speak, the language that you happen to speak, you're, you're, you're both, I know, at least bilingual. Um, to the best of my knowledge, you, you are not only bilingual, but you are people who write in more than one language. Uh, of, of course, an issue which has a, um, a special importance, I think, in the Americas, where the dominance of English is felt very, very powerfully. Um, but you've both written very eloquently about language. And that takes me to a third point that Claudio, you put at the front of, of your new book. Um, it's not only about the languages that you know, this is also about the languages that you've forgotten or you were never taught or you never knew. Uh, it's about the languages that your family um, felt an obligation for you to forget or to forget in general. Uh, German, Yiddish, Polish, Russian, Romanian, and, and so on. Um, and that takes me then to the th third area that I find um, interesting, and that is the whole question of forgetting. Uh, um, th there's one way of thinking about these books as essays in the recuperation of memory. Um, but actually, I think that as important a theme to both of you is, is forgetting, is what we forget. It, 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 maybe one could say the value of forgetting. Um, that fantastic short story by Borges, Funes the Memorius, the little boy who goes mad because he can't forget anything. Um, so I'm interested to, to, to hear your thoughts about that because the form that you've both chosen of late is one where we live in a state of forgetting and the act of trying to remember things is written into your texts. It's not just that you recover things, you tell us that you're trying to recover things. Quite a lot there, Mark. First of all, it's, 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 it's a pleasure to see you, uh, even, even through, through video. Uh, you too. And it's an honor to be here and, and, and chatting with both you and, and, and Claudio. Um, the, the, as I was reading Claudio in the, in the last couple of weeks, getting ready for, for today, Claudio's book, um, the, the three or four thing, big topics that you mentioned are obviously there. But what I kept thinking about, Mark, is how, how alike we are with Claudio, not only in, 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 in background, uh, although we're from different generations, we are very, very similar in that we, we were born in Latin America, we were born in, into Spanish, then moved to the United States. Uh, our, our, our family history is similar. Um, Eastern European Jews uh, for him, for, for me on, on my mother's side as well, not on my father's side, as you know, that's, that's, that's more Arabic. Um, but, and here's the big but, uh, our ways of writing about our family are very different. Yes. Um, I, 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 I get the sense, and I hope we get Claudio back mm -hmm. <laughs> so that he can, he can uh, uh, talk will. about this. Uh, he, he's much more structured. He's coming at his family from a very... Uh, anthropological point of view, a very academic point of view, uh, and I'm not. Uh, my, my, my way of, of, of approaching my family, because it is an approach uh, when I do it. Uh, you, get the, you, you mentioned the grandparents, and, and in my writing, grandparents are, are, are fundamental, yes. uh, especially the two grandfathers, so far, <laughs> I don't know if I'm getting uh, into my grandmother's stories soon, perhaps, but so far I've really dealt with the two grandfathers. Um, and when people read my stories or, or my books, they get a sense of uh, proximity and nostalgia and, and love and nothing could be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was, I did not have a very intimate relationship with either of them. Uh, there was, a, there was a big age difference. They were from a very different 
generation where grandparents were, were you know, patriarchal and, and distant from their, from their grandkids. Uh, I always tell the story of my great grandfather uh, who would only allow the grandkids and great grandkids to kiss his hand. Uh, you know, there's this, 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 this old man from Aleppo, from Syria, that there was just no physical contact whatsoever. And the emotional contact was not there with my grandparents growing up. And I start getting close to them through writing. It was when I began to write uh, late, as you know, or as we can, we can talk about, uh, that, I, that I start looking into their uh, histories, their stories of exodus, their stories of survival, uh, and in, 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 in their death, they're, they're not around anymore. So it isn't a physical figure that I'm, that I'm going after. It's more of a familial uh, figure head, you know, a, a, a symbolic figure that I, that I tried to, to get to. Now, so sim symbolizing what then? Sorry. For yeah, and that's, that's what? What? Yeah, because yeah, you, that, it's interesting that you said the emotional exactly of your grandparents isn't what exactly and i think we have claudio back yes have claudio back yes but continue please okay please. so and, and this i think is the major difference between claudio and and, and and my writing is that i i i work with fiction or I, I work in fiction or i work through fiction so although my stories or my books appear to be memoir or they appear to be history or they appear to be uh, a, 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 a researched uh, account of my family. They are not. Yes. They are fiction. And the reason for that, Mark, or, the, or, the, or what I think is the reason for that, because I really don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing, as most fiction writers will tell you, um, is the emotional content. It's, 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 it's what I want to give my readers is not my family's history, it's not the story of my grandfather in Auschwitz. It's the feeling of what it, the sense of that story or, or the emotional content of that story. Something Werner Herzog calls the ecstatic truth. Mm -hmm. So not the factual truth, but the, 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 the truth of ecstasy, the truth of, 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 of a sensation. Um, and I think that's where Claudio and my writing diverges. Uh, it, I am not interested in the facts of my grandfather's story, but in the kernel of the, the essence of it. And I will get to that essence of it. I, I will try to get us to the essence of it. I mean, us readers and, and, and myself through fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, Claudio, do you see that as a difference? Welcome back, by the way. But Thanks, uh, we had a blackout here, my apologies. Uh, not at uh, all. I'm <laughs> glad you're back. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> So, so, so Eduardo is uh, conscious of this difference with what you do, that he sees, you know, the, the question of, of, of veracity as some, there's a different kind of veracity right. at, mm -hmm. at stake. Um, mm -hmm. it, do you see it in that way? If you compare what you're doing with what he's doing? Um, maybe, not that much, a little bit. Um, in, in, I mean, uh, certainly, um, uh, I am, it's true, I'm very interested in, in facts and research. Uh, uh, research is what I do. Um, <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> I suspect that there is no way of writing fiction without the research as well. I'm a little suspicious of, uh, of what Eduardo just said in the sense that I think that uh, uh, you, 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 you may free yourself from the research in, in, in seeking that truth. Yeah. But I don't think that you free yourself from the research as a precondition for the writing, no, uh, is no, my impression. No. You're correct. You're correct. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing where I think I would, I would kind of qualify, I, I mean, I, I agree with what I said, but I'd like to qualify it. I mean, uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know what kind of book my book, Nuestra America is. Uh, it's not published by an academic press. It's not an academic book, but um, in whatever it is in terms of um, in terms of genre has a, 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 a component of 
uh, fiction in the sense that all history has a, com a, a component of fiction that is uh, history is kind of what happened, right? And history is also the telling of what happened. And the tell those two are not the same thing. And um, so the telling of what happened uh, it involves fiction and the more so in the case, in, my, in the case of this particular book of mine, because um, the, the information that actually exists on my grandparents uh, and uh, uh, the, the book is really about the 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 question about the in the book to, to a large degree was how is it possible that i had a happy childhood because i did i had a wonderful like a magical childhood how did that happen uh, and th that occupies a very little small space in the book but uh, the book is a research into that question to some extent, and it involves a lot of the, about forgetting, as Mark po uh, pointed out, and the value of forgetting and the achievement of forgetting, actually, um, because I don't think that forgetting is always so easy. Um, in, but uh, in the, the, quote, data, to use that kind of language, to write that family history of mine was actually often quite scanty, and it required... Um, all kinds of, um, of the, the, yes, their techniques, his, the historians' techniques um, of the kind actually, Mark, that you have in your in in your uh, uh, book about about your your grandfather and your grandparents. Um, that kind of technique is fundamental to the work that I'm doing. And there, I think that's true. What I agree with Eduardo there. Um, I also think that uh, the question that Eduardo is talking about about the kind of truth that you can reach through fiction. And that you can't really reach through research of the traditional kind. I agree with that. Um, I, am, I think that uh, there's a kind of literary truth that, in some ways, more philosophical and um, um, uh, and come, gets closer to the word truth than historical research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think we agree, Claudia. I think we're both um, getting or approaching a similar idea in what we're saying. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit, Mark, if I may, of the way I, I my, my process in, in writing these pieces. Um, Claudio, I, don't, I don't know if you know this, but I'm, I'm very much an, an engineer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I don't come from the literary world. Mm -hmm. I didn't study literature. I'm, I'm an engineer both by degree university degree and by temperament. I am, I am, I'm very, very methodical mm -hmm. and, and systematic and neurotic. If, 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 if you, I if envy I, you. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, <laughs> at times. <laughs> I'm sure my wife might disagree a little bit. But, but anyway. um, and I'm, I'm that way uh, everywhere except for when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. So when I start writing a, a piece whatever it is, uh, because I don't know what it is when I start. Uh, I, I don't know where it's going. I just have a, 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 a slight glimpse uh, of an image. Um, uh, I love the, the Walter Benjamin uh, quote at the end of your introduction of, of a, a glimmer, you know, in, into a, a, a glimmer of danger. Uh, and that's, that's sort of what I feel when I start. But what I did, I think, and this may differentiate our processes a little bit is that I created a narrator. Mm -hmm. uh, so it isn't me that's that's living the stories, but somebody who has my name, but is a fictional extension of me. So a, a fictional character uh, who smokes a lot and who travels a lot and who's got a very different temperament from mine. And he was born uh, six or seven books ago and, and, and keeps going, you know? he's, he's kept going. And what he does, or what I do when I'm, when I'm creating these worlds for him is that I will take my family's facts or the data and use them as backdrop. So I set up a stage as if I'm writing theater and I know you've written theater and we can, I wanna ask you a couple of questions about that later. I, I set up a context that is very similar to my bi biography. Yeah? So the props, the backdrop, the stage, uh, and I will insert a drama into that stage. And that drama is fiction. It's, 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 a tra it's, it's, it's a way of lulling the reader into thinking it's memoir, into could, thinking could it's- Could you give an example? Could you give us any, do you have something to hand you could read us? 
uh, read you. Um, a few, a paragraph perhaps. But it might be too long. Uh, and in English, I don't have anything here in English. I'm looking at my books. <laughs> They're Spanish. Something, something, and Claudio, I had the same thought for you perhaps. Uh, um, but sorry, Edward, I didn't mean to interrupt. Let me, let me think about what to read. I would appreciate your yeah. voice. Yeah, but 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 I can give you an example of a, of a of a of a story, for example, of of of, of um, let's see, my grandfather's story in Auschwitz. Yes, that's yeah. a very 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 uh, uh, typical story in, in in the way that I write. Uh, the story is based on an anecdote that my grandfather told me, mm. and he told it to me very quickly. Uh, it, to him, it was nothing more than an anecdote. He, he, I think he told it to me in about a minute mark. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I was sent to Auschwitz because of this. This happened. I survived. And when he told me that story, I immediately saw the ripples. I saw mm -hmm. the, the, the texture of that story. Uh, but, but I knew that I needed to, I needed a vehicle for it. I needed a stage for it. I couldn't, if not, it just, it stayed as an anecdote. So then I start building this stage, which is uh, a meeting with a grandfather, a bottle of whiskey. It, it, it almost reads that story. It almost reads like a, like a, like a dialogue, like a theater dialogue between two, two, two characters. And the grandfather is telling his grandson uh, what happened to him. And the grandson, and this goes to, to your introduction to the, to the chat, is trying to imagine his grandfather as a kid going mm -hmm. through this and trying to imagine uh, his grandfather as an adolescent uh, and is trying to, to remember his memories, his own memories of his grandfather's number. So what, I've, what, I, what I started doing, and, and this is the, the, the fictional part of the process, suddenly it became a story about the grandson. I slowly saw the flipping of the narrative and, it, it, and the narrative in front of me without me wanting or, or trying to do this suddenly became, it went from a story about an, a man in Auschwitz to a story about a grandson in the moment he receives his family story. In the moment his grandfather gives him his legacy and what happens in the in the inside, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the mind of this narrator. But this is, I think, where the question of truth comes back in, because it, I think that um, uh, uh, the, the truth that, that, is, that is powering your stories is your truth. It's, a, it's a, well, yes. as imagined, your, your truth. Uh, right. We could have an argument about the other truths that lie behind that, because I think actually there is a larger set of historical truths that you, are careful not to depart too far from. Uh, there is a something there, but you have devised this vehicle that you have the skill to make work, which is to do exactly what you've just described to us very eloquently and, and to, to shift the truth in question to, to, to your truth. And that is, I think, the power that it has on people. And Claudio, I was wondering what, what you thought listening to this, um, about what you were able to do with your materials. Um, and, and perhaps you could tell us yeah. a little bit about, about your working methods, because I think this is something we don't talk enough about. Well, first, uh, this particular book of mine is, is, is unique, it's different from any others, because it is about my, my family and my own, what I think of as the sort of the conditions for my, of my existence. That's what the book is about. The book ends uh, during my childhood. So it's not really a, about me. And at the same time, it's completely a, about me. Um, a, the problem that I had, I think, starts very differently from uh, what Eduardo just described. And part of my, my first problem really was a language problem. Um, <clears throat> that is, uh, I wanted to write this particular history because it was mine. And because no one else would write it, I realized at a certain point that no one else could write it. Uh, no one else in my family could write it. Um, it. Of course, if they could have, they would have written something very different, but still they couldn't even write whatever, some, some kind of 
equivalent. So I wanted to write it. But then the problem is I really couldn't uh, because uh, for a number of reasons, uh, the first of which is that I lacked, uh, you know, four, four languages uh, that were necessary should it, in, from, from any scholarly point of view, uh, from any serious scholarly point of view, I lacked four languages. I speak, you know, three, four languages, but I, you know, I, my, my grandparents spoke eight or nine languages. Um, and uh, in, it, and so in some way, the undertaking was irresponsible from the start. That is, I couldn't really, I couldn't really be fully uh, a scholar, uh, a responsible scholar. Uh, so the first thing I had to confront was the forgetting of those languages and also my own language, my own languages. And, their, um, and my, uh, what I think of as my own lack of language, because I think that uh, the, the, the starting point for me for being able to write this book was confronting what I call uh, my sort of alingualism, which is that I, I, I grew up quite, uh, to a large extent, bilingual, although I speak a couple other languages, really it's English and Spanish. And those are the two languages that I write in. And I've always felt insecure in both languages. In, in, that hasn't stopped me from writing because those are the ones that I have. Um, I can't do better than that. So the, re the reflection on a, that, it's like having a limp or something, a, a, has been, at, was at the core of the book and goes through the book all the, all the time. And um, whether there's a truth in that uh, or not, you know, it's for others to judge. It's a, it's a story of imperfections, isn't it? The way you describe it. Uh, nobody else is going to write this story. Um, so I'd better write it. Uh, that's the first one. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, then the second one is, well, I don't really have the language to write it in, but I'm just going to make do. And mm -hmm. that's the second one, which I completely admire. I think it's the way things get done and it, 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 it dictates a certain stance on the world, actually. Uh, which is to say that language of paradise is always in the, that you start with, is always in the back of your mind and always slightly out of reach. And, and actually it's the thing that gives, uh, for both of you, I think, America, in the broadest sense, a special poignancy, because that was going to be the paradise. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, after Europe. I, I, uh, would you allow, I wanted to read that paragraph from which Eduardo, you, you quoted Benjamin, because I found it so interesting, Claudio, at the beginning of your book, um, that I wanted to ask you something about it. So you're talking about Misha, uh, one of your grandfathers. Uh, for him, the idea of a new world was a necessity. His idea of America had less to do with nostalgia for the past than with the reality that needed to be achieved. Our America, the America of my family, was a necessary place that one must inhabit and defend. And then you go on to this question of danger and destiny that I find so interesting. And you say this, even today, we still live in a dangerous world that is constantly asking us to make decisions. Yet we can only face our collective dilemmas by way of encrypted personal stories. This is the rationale for the form. Because as Walter Benjamin put it, to tell the past is to take ownership of a memory, quote, just as it glimmers in the instant of a danger. Thus peril is at once collective and deeply personal. We are no longer governed by tradition, so we can't simply rely on a collective past. For this reason, family history is again relevant. It's no longer an aristocratic incantation of the glories of a lineage, but very simply our precondition, a matrix of past decisions that made us possible, which I thought was uh, an incredibly interesting and eloquent uh, um, explanation of why it is, I think, particularly now, that so many people are drawn to this, both to try to write in this in a variety of ways. I mean, as Eduardo, as you say, the way you and Claudio write is in many ways quite distinct. And yet in other ways, it has this common search for a lot of resonance, yeah. through, through, through family. The, 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 the the thing that occurred to me was your emphasis on decisions, the decisions, the matrix of past decisions that made us possible. Mm -hmm. Because another way of thinking about the beauty of, um, of a family history is it's really just a matter of accidents. 
And it's a very good way and at, at getting at this uh, almost accidental, I mean, what could be more accidental than our emergence into the world? Uh, and, and so there is a randomness that I see in your book and a randomness, Eduardo, that I see in yours, which, which is very striking. And of course, which is not something that you can easily achieve in a literary form because true randomness would be completely illegible. Um, so there, there is this random quality, this searching for things, the, the, the totally contingent fact that somebody was left on one side of the river and somebody else wasn't, for instance. Yes, yes, I, I, I agree, Mark. Uh, it, when I started looking at, at my, why my grandparents wound up in Latin America, mm -hmm. the, the stories were so bizarre and, and, and so irrational. Um, most of them are family lore, so you, you don't know how much to believe, but there's this accidental journey that took them to Guatemala, of all places. Um, uh, one, for example, was, was the father of my Egyptian grandmother. Uh, they didn't tell him that the boat would stop first in Guatemala. He thought he was going to Panama, and he thought he had reached Panama and got off and stayed. Uh, by, by accident, who knows if that's true. But one thing about the paragraph that you read, which I love, Claudia, by the way, the, 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 the word that jumped out at me uh, immediately was encrypted or encrypted personal stories. Claudio, I have a, I have a question for you, if, if, if I may. Uh, why, how, how encrypted, why encrypted? In my world, in my fictional world, I work with encryption intentionally. I want to encrypt my personal story. <laughs> in, yours, in your world, I get the sense that you want to decrypt mm -hmm. your, your personal story. Is, is that correct or, or not, or no? Yeah, I think that's true, at least to a degree. I mean, I, 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 I want to, de to, to decipher things decipher. To, 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 some, to some degree. Uh, but at the same time, I think that there's a way in which um, um, ancestors, even my parents, um, uh, um, are never completely legible. Um, uh, um, but yes, um, to me, part of the, the, the problem of... Uh, of encryption, it has to do with the question of silence that was also brought up by 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 Mark in the beginning, um, because I think that the silences, um, <clears throat> at least in in the story of my my uh, family, uh, many of those silences um, were done with some protective aim, um, um, in sometimes self protective, but often protective of, of the others, of the children, of the other generations. And nevertheless, there is some, there is, um, uh, there is transgenerational, um, there's transmission across the generations. And that transmission to me is very mysterious. How is it that that happens when you have so much that you don't know, so much that's completely undecipherable? Uh, so I think that to me, deciphering at least some things mm -hmm. is important in, but not never with the aim of trying to <laughs> know it all, but mm -hmm. simply to know how deep it goes mm -hmm. with, a, you know, the, 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 the depth of, and maybe some of them, sorry about that here. I'm not an engineer, but I am an anthropologist. And so a, 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 I am interested in some of the mechanics of that. Yeah. And, and for me, the, the, the deciphering is, the groundwork that I need, um, the staging that I need. So I need to, for example, when I went off to Poland to look for my grandfather's apartment, I don't care about my grandfather's apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 it is irrelevant to me in the, in the context of the story. I need the, the setup to work. So all of the data and all of the, all of the, 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 the deciphering of his history, what street was it on, um, is all a ruse. It's all a, 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 a way for me to get the reader into the story. And then what happens in there is 
is what happened. Now I can, now I can, now I can play with the reader. <laughs> Eduardo, forgive me, but you went to Poland to look for it. So, so it I did actually have some importance to you. Otherwise, you could have sat but, at home and made the whole thing up. But the going to Poland, Mark, yes. But the going to Poland is part of the setup because I need, I need uh, the smell of the street to describe right. it. I need the names of the businesses on. Yeah. So I went to, I went physically, went to his building. But but what happens when I get there is uh, fiction, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's all a part of the staging. Uh, yeah. that, that I need that the, the, the I, I don't care to decipher his story yes. yeah uh, I want to encrypt it as much as possible uh, almost a, almost almost as a poet would you know as 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 as, as a poetry works um, Claudio this this there, brings it back to the your problem I find the problem very different because to me yeah. part of it the difficulty is what to do with the with the not glimmer but the glare almost of the family mythologies and how to get, uh, how, how to understand, for example, um, my maternal grandparents, who is a lot of the book is about my maternal grandparents, uh, were very close to this figure, Jose Carlos Mariategui, very famous uh, yeah. uh, Marxist in, from Peru in, in the 1920s. And so, you know, there's the, in, in my history, there's the grandeur of Mariategui, right? Uh, now that I knew since I was a kid, um, but in order to read the book, to write the book, um, um, I had to actually read Mariategui um, and to try and understand how it was that my grandparents might have been so close to him. Mm -hmm. And that actually was extremely demanding work. And um, in, for me, because in fact, what I had in front of me was um, a story that I already knew. Right. So you were, uh, trying, to, you were trying to get behind it to, uh, to something else that we, where what you knew was getting in the way. What I knew was getting in the way, yeah, absolutely. But I'll, I'll use a similar example, um, to, but flip it. <laughs> uh, for me, family lore, these, 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 the, this glare, is extremely attractive. Mm -hmm. uh, one example, uh, there's, a, there's a family lore that my grandfather, Halfon, mm -hmm. my, his father, my great-grandfather, was an arms dealer for Pancho Villa. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that. I have, I, I, in Mexico? Because if he was, yeah. I, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. great friends with Friedrich Katz, who was yeah. one of my closest friends, yeah. who the great historian of Pancho Villa, so I can find out. We can, I have I have a photo of a meet, of a of possible meeting. So we're gonna we're, we'll Although talk you about. You probably this. don't care, but I can find out if it's. True. No, I do care. I, I do care because then that would tempt me into recreating that, uh, in, through fiction. You know, so for me, I, all I need is the glimmer, which which I understand Benjamin's danger with that because it is there is this. You know, it's, a, it's, it's an appeal to something that might be forbidden as well, mm -hmm. uh, at least to your family. And, and I usually write about forbidden stories. Uh, I, I, I've always done this. Mm -hmm. uh, Can I ask one more thing? And then I think we, if people have questions uh, from the audience that they put to James, we can, we can ask you some of their questions. But in the spirit of deciphering or decrypting, uh, the question of men and women, I mean, here we are, we're, we're three males, and um, the family history is obviously at its, at its heart, the history of, in the period we're talking about anyway, the history of relationships between men and women. And um, they figure very differently in your, in your two works, at, at, the, at least the works of yours that I've, I've read, uh, Eduardo, perhaps because of the setting that they've been in. They, there have been women, but the, the, the stories have really been about men, imagining me, other men, older, younger, their relationships. Mm -hmm. Claudio, I think they're, they're, you were really trying to figure out your mother, grandmother's side, as well as grandfather's. But I wonder, you know, it's an interesting question, I think, if there are special difficulties in doing that, whether they're difficulties that come from you being male, different, 
difficulties that come from the fact that there was differential access to, to writing and to letters and to the written record. So I just wanted to throw that out there for both of you, whether you've thought about, I'm sure you've thought about this. For my part, um, um, it, it, it wasn't that hard to, to uh, to, it was impossible not to write about my grandmother because <laughs> she was quite uh, a presence. It's very difficult not to write about her. Um, but, uh, and about some of the, my mother, who was very, also very dominant uh, kind of a, a person, uh, to some extent, that kind of my family has a, a kind of matriarchal mm -hmm. um, uh, accent. Uh, but, um, but I think that one of the, the difficulties <clears throat> for me in writing this does have to do with the problem of family unity. In my family, family unity is a very big thing. In, in, in my, my maternal family, my, my paternal family is totally, you know, just totally dispersed. There's the opposite of union. But in my, my maternal family had a, a real anxiety, even I would say has, I still have, um, about staying together, keeping together family unity. And I think that family unity uh, does have a, a, an, an accident against women because at least for those generations, um, because uh, in the end, whatever sacrifices were made uh, were also differentially made uh, by sex. And, uh, a, and those differences get a little bit papered over in the name of unity. So I think that there is a little bit of a tension sometimes in writing and even even beginning to imagine the situation of the women in certain generations, given the collective investment in unity. That, that is a collective investment, not just of the men. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I find interesting what you say, Claudio, that, that your family, it was the, the grandmothers that, that were the dominant figures. In, in my case, it was the opposite. And you can tell uh, it was the two grandfathers. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, Mark, that's why I tended to their stories first. Um, I, 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 I don't have a plan for this. There's no project in, in fiction. Uh, but I have, I have an idea that at some point I will go to uh, in, or, or get into my grandmother's stories. The, 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 they're both as fascinating. Um, it's just, it just happened the other way around. It's just, I started with the two male, big dominant, uh, jerarcas <laughs> first. Oh, I, I had that too. I had that too. It's just, <laughs> it's, sure it is. my grandmother was not a jerarca. She was impossible to ignore. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you ignored her at your peril, put it that way. <laughs> so we have some questions, uh, uh, which I would like to share with you. Uh, um, one was to ask both of you about the question of indigenous peoples and whether your family is engaged with the ethnic cleavages in the countries that you settled in. And uh, yeah, whether you have a response to that. Claudio? Uh, sure. Well, for a big chunk of my book is, is exactly about that because my, my grandfather, uh, my, my, my maternal grandfather, uh, what uh, became an indigenista with Mariati, and there's a good chunk in the book about the relationship between the Jewish experience in um, uh, in Bessarabia and Romania, uh, uh, the Russian and the Austro-Hungarian empires, uh, which is kind of the space that they moved in, uh, uh, and uh, the indigenous question in South America, and how that those two came together. Uh, one. Uh, one core question for me is actually the influence of Jewish thinking on Mariati, who was a fundamental uh, thinker for the Indian, quote, well, what at that time was, was known as the Indian question, um, and who wanted, whose project was to redo Peruvian nationalism on the basis of the experience of the indigenous population, which at that time was four-fifths of the population of Peru. Uh, and and my grandfather's thinking about the Jewish thing uh, in relation to the indigenous question. So in fact, those two issues, the indigenous and the Indian question, are at the center of that part of uh, my story, which is really the uh, 
probably the most important part of, of the book. On my father's side, who was a, who my father was a German Jew who arrived, uh, their family arrived to Santiago in Chile. Um, there was uh, <clears throat> maybe a less, uh, uh, a less intense connection with that question. Eduardo? Um, yeah, in my case, the short answer is no. Uh, and, and I have a feeling, Claudio, in, in your case, was, it, was your uh, father an academic? Yeah, my father was a scientist. Yeah. He's a geophysicist. Yeah. In my family, Mark, it, uh, Mark, Claudia, you, you begin your book by, by describing a situation very, very common to most Jews, this idea of always present but never invited to the banquet, you say? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, eternal witnesses. Mm -hmm. I, I, the, the metaphor I use always uh, when, I, when I was growing up in Guatemala is that as one of the very, very few Jewish families in the country, there's less than 100 families in the entire country back then. Yeah. Now there's even less, I think, because mm -hmm. of assimilation and, and, and just people leaving. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was allowed to watch the game, but not allowed to play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all of my friends had their first communion. All of my friends celebrated Christmas, all of my friends, but we lived this, this almost in the periphery of the country, never really part of it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, we, you pretend to be from these, these places as Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, I can dress the part mm -hmm. as, I, mean, I can pretend to be Guatemalan, but I was never really part of the, the, the social or the cultural fabric of the country. Mm -hmm. um, so my memories of that time, of my family, of my grandparents are very involved with the Jewish mm -hmm. in the temples, in the synagogue, in, 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 with, the, with the children. There was a Jewish school, uh, uh, although there was very, very few Jews. Uh, so they were more into that and into their businesses, not mm -hmm. at all uh, with the indigenous, not, not even, I would say, aware of the, the, the problem, no? And in mm -hmm. Guatemala, you have a, a, an ex 80% indigenous country. Um, so there's so, a, there was another question, Eduardo, that, that links to that, I think, which was mm -hmm. um, that somebody had said that um, your, your book, Manana Nunga, has a strong autobiographical angle to it through the adult narrator focalizing on the childhood self. How difficult, this is the question, was it to come to terms with your ideological distance from your own family's Guatemalan past? Uh, given that their privilege was linked to the exploitative class system of yeah. Guatemala, um, yeah. so, uh, but, which I think goes to what you're talking about, that, you, that they come from Europe where they're the underdogs and they come to, to, to South America and Central America where they're not, exact, they're not the underdogs, but they're not exactly the overdogs either. Right, right. Yeah, I, I understand the question because it, 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 there, is, there, there, there was this sense of uh, growing up extremely sheltered, overprotected, and separated, physically separated, Mark, from the political turmoil that was happening in Guatemala in the 1970s. There was a, there was a, there was a huge war, a huge war going on in the country that had been going on for two decades, um, and we never heard about it. We never uh, were taught about it. We were, it was never discussed. Um, my family's politics, were very right leading, uh, as, as most Latin Americans with money uh, back then, you know, of, of, of a very privileged class, but they wanted that situation to stay as 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 it had always been. Uh, and 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 in that book, Mañana Nunca Lo Hablamos, it's it's the story of a, of, a, of a young boy who who is me growing up in the Guatemala of the 1970s, and slowly realizing the situation, slowly becoming aware of, of what's going on, what's being kept from him, um, why the, the, the vast majority of the, of the country is, is mistreated uh, as human beings, as employees, as, um, and it, it, it was in a way, the, this awakening in the child and in me as well, uh, a distancing myself from my family. It, it, it had to be. It, right. Right. So we, we have a sort of connected question from Judith Gurevich, who is not only Claudio's publisher, but my publisher too. Uh, thank you, Judith, for this. Uh, um, uh, Judith comments, it's so interesting that the three of you focus on family more than the context. Uh, 
I guess that's true of our discussions so, so far. The context has come to seem like, you know, what you have to have in order to tell your story. And yet what makes your book so compelling, especially the ones I know, is the compelling way you explain the context and historical facts behind the family story so that the emotional investment of you as writers talking about family gives the audience historical knowledge in ways that are delightful. Are, are you aware that this is the effect of the book on the reader? That, that, I think that's interesting to think about how we've been talking about context and, uh, and, 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 and family. Um, I know that in my own case, actually, I did write my book about my family very much as a historian trying to tackle a certain kind of historical problem, which was uh, how you would uh, explore the effect of, of uh, politics on the private self and the personality. And the family was then the necessary mechanism. Um, but I think this is an interesting question. And, and in a way, Eduardo, you, you, that's your answer, I think, to the previous question got at this too. There was some way of talking this through, which was in a way, but also not to talk about yeah. the family. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. It's, 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 it's a way of uh, making the historical context emotional. Yeah. yeah. So how, how can I give the reader the historical context in an emotional way? Uh, yeah. I think is, is, is what a, a fiction writer is trying to get at. Um, and I find myself in, in most of the stories that I write, Mark, I do need to set them up, um, whether it be uh, a, a 1960s kidnapping or a 1970s growing up in Guatemala or my, my, my Polish grandfather uh, leaving Germany after the war. Um, by the way, that's him in the, in the bicycle in, the, in, 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 in our event poster. Um, but how can I take that data, again, we come to that word, Claudio, <laughs> that, that historical information and make it emotional. Uh, I don't know if the way I do it, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm aware of the way I do it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, just, I just know when I'm, I'm doing it too much. Yeah, I, can, I, can, I have a sense that when I'm getting too historical or, or too data driven, I need to, I need to pull back you because it is a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Claudio, what do you think? Um, I, I, I agree with the Jude's um, point. I, I, I think that maybe the one thing I would, I would say is that in some way to talk about context is a little bit um, misleading because <clears throat> it's really the content. Um, not, not, uh, uh, that, 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 that context is really the content. It's, it's you trying to find um, what it is that, 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 uh, that people lived or are living. And, um, um, and yes, in order to find that out, you sometimes need to reach a little further than what was most immediate to the family person. And you need to do that in part even to understand and to make up your own mind about what it is that might have been going on in the life of a, of a family member. But uh, so you do need to kind of re reach out, reach, reach further than what was most immediate in order to be able to decide what was most immediate. But uh, in that sense, it's, it's uh, what we call context is to some extent, um, I think, uh, a, a part of the process of understanding that the writer needs to go through, or at least the writer, me, um, but I don't think I'm unique that way, but a, a, a need, I, I need to go through in order a, to, to actually be able to construct a content because the content is actually always a little shifty when, uh, when you write it. You're always writing exposed. You're always, uh, you never have uh, really access to, to everything. So you have to make a lot of decisions. Um, getting back to that, that word that Mark used before about decisions, it's, it's not only the decisions in the past that concern me in this book and how they affect me and my children and others uh, that, I'm, that I'm worried about, um, <clears throat> but it's also my own decisions in the writing. And those decisions are not, uh, are weighty decisions. They're, they're, they, they, they can't be taken lightly. And that's why 
you get something like context because you need to reach further out in order to make the decision. Can I ask one final question perhaps, which is about who you're writing for, both of you. I mean, uh, 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 Claudio, I was very struck that you said that somehow the, you, you, the disguised motive or question in your mind for, for you in writing the book was to come to understand how you'd had a chap happy childhood or something along those lines, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I started off by talking about how strange it is that we, we find ourselves in the position of choosing a topic which means that we write about our grandparents when they were children. But I, I, I'd like you to, I, I wonder how important, or in this question that I have for you about who you're writing for, whether, whether are, are you writing for, for other people, for children, for people younger than you? Um, what is, what is the purpose of this? Who, who is it directed to? I mean, this, this, uh, this book is a book that I couldn't have written at any, just at any time. It's a very specific- I suppose that's uh, what I'm asking. And, um, and the time when I wrote it was a, shortly after my father's death, uh, shortly after a divorce, the beginning of a new relationship. Um, <clears throat> um, with two kids who are already you know, a young woman, a young man. Um, so um, in part, I, I was doing it in, at, at first really for myself and for my kids, to be honest. Um, and, um, and then it, it became, as the adventure of writing it, um, developed because it is um, uh, you know it it became clear to me that I had to learn so much in order to write it and I was learning so much in writing it that that there would be um, others who were interested I wasn't always so clear on who those others might be and there I think I I, I did uh, gain uh, gain a lot from discussions with my editor with uh, with uh, some friends, etc. But uh, the writing for a good long while was actually quite private. Thank you, Eduardo. How about how about you? I've been I've been sitting here for two minutes trying to come up with a with a clever answer, and I can't. <laughs> I, I don't I don't know, Mark. I I don't know who I'm writing for. It isn't uh, myself. It isn't my publishers. Although I want to please them. Um, it isn't really my readers. Uh, Cancion, my new book, is the sixth book in, a, in, a, in this saga of this same narrator. So I, there's these, these readers that are waiting for the new, almost like a serial, no? I'm, I'm, I'm almost giving it to them by, by mm -hmm. little, little by little. So they're waiting for this next chapter of the saga. Uh, but I don't have any of this in mind when I'm writing. The only thing I have in mind is the story. Yeah, how can, how can I tell this story as beautiful as possible? Mm. Uh, so it, it, it is about the language of it. Uh, I, you know my books, uh, not the English version so much, but the Spanish, the original Spanish versions are very, very short books. I write novelas, which are 80, 90 page short stories. They're, they're long short stories and I love that form. And I, I'll write the first draft very quickly and then spend maybe two or three years just working on how I'm telling the language. Um, so the best answer I can give you, although it's a little cliche, is, is for the story itself. Thank you. Well, you know, in, in conclusion, I, 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 I enjoyed the discussion because actually I think for me, uh, it brought together how similar it is what we're all trying to do. Uh, and, um, Yes, you could say from one point of view, Eduardo, that, you know, you, I, I understand the, the insistence that you're writing fiction has a purpose. It's a liberating purpose and it's correct. It's not, I don't disagree with it. Um, and on the other hand, uh, I, I, if I can speak for you, Claude, you and I are coming out of a different uh, training that has deformed us to the point where we are very conscious of what you can and cannot say, what we can and cannot say. But actually, the more the conversation progressed, the more I thought that these things are starting to get a little blurred in my mind. 
And um, it was interesting to hear the way you the way you work, Eduardo, because you need the sanction of some truth from what yeah. you said to be inspired. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that was interesting to me. There is a relationship, just as there's a relationship in your wonderful, wonderful stories between actual places and actual experiences and the story. You liberate yourself, but not everybody could do with that liberation what you do uh, to, to your own purpose. And on the other hand, uh, I think that we, although, you know, one is very conscious of, um, not wanting to, uh, or at least making a very clear distinction, I'll speak for myself, between what is speculative and what can be borne out by evidence and being very, very careful, especially about the speculative stuff. One is more and more conscious of being a narrator, of, of, a, of a narrative voice, of a, 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 I mean, these, these books that have, we've all crafted do complex things with time very complex. The minute you get into a family story, you abandon all sense of linearity, even though the genealogical form seems to demand linearity. And so this is, this is a challenge that brings one closer, I think. And that, that's that common ground that we've been exploring that I find very, very interesting. Anyway, I think we probably, unfortunately, we've reached the time of our, of our to end our conversation, but, but I wanted to thank you both very much, Eduardo Halfon and Claudio Lomnitz, uh, for joining me to talk about these things and for a conversation that I hope will continue for a long time. Thank you. I do too. Thank, thank you, you, Mark. Thank you, Claudio. Thank you. <clears throat>